Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Don't be anxious about anything. How does that command strike you? We've been talking about fear these past several weeks and recognizing that fear operates at pretty deep levels within our minds and even within our bodies. And so to read an invitation or a command like this, to not be anxious, to not worry about anything, maybe it actually feels kind of discouraging. I wonder if some of us actually start to feel about some of Paul's writings, the way Paul seemed to feel about the law of Moses, that all it could do was tell us what a bad job we were doing at keeping it. There wasn't any actual power for transformation. Have you ever felt that way? You read something like this in scripture, don't be anxious, and your mind immediately goes to guilt about all the anxiety that you feel about so many different things. As we bring this exploration of fear to a close, I want to end by looking at some practical ways that we can respond when we feel afraid. Practical ways to manage our fear, to move toward this space of being free of anxiety. As a preacher, this word practical can become a little bit problematic for me. My comfort zone, my safe space, is the realm of ideas. I like to think about ideas, think about other people who've thought about ideas and written about ideas. And I like to stay up here at this level of sort of abstraction. Here are some ideas, but then the way those ideas filter down into practice, I leave that up to you. So this morning, I'm going to try to uh, go in a little bit different direction and try to lean into some of this practicality. And I'll be honest, because ideas are sort of my safe space, this actually touches some fear for me. There are fears that go along with trying to give practical tips. Uh, I'm afraid that I might say the wrong thing. I'm afraid that I might give bad advice. As much as I try to be faithful in my interpretation of scripture, as much as I try to have integrity in how I look at the culture, the reality is I may misunderstand some things. And so I don't think of my role primarily as advice giving, which is good because I'm not super great at giving advice. I was talking with someone this past week who was saying they're trying to deal with some little bit of minor depression that's come into their life as they live through this pandemic season. And I said, have you tried pizza? And I'm not gonna lie, it worked, but it's not exactly a long-term practical solution. It's actually pretty bad advice. And so I have some fear that I might give you bad advice. But there's other fear that I might actually say the right things, but what I say and what you hear are different. There's this mismatch or lack of connection between what I think I said and what you thought you heard. So that's fearful for me. But probably the biggest fear for me is actually that I could say the right things and you could hear the right things and you could even do the difficult work of putting it into practice and life might still be hard. That's part of the challenge, the difficulty, the complexity of being a person of faith it's because we want to believe that if we do the right things, uh, we will be rewarded. We want to believe that our life is basically contingent upon our own actions. And we actually have suggestions of that in scripture, like the book of Proverbs. It seems to be pretty clear that if you do right, you will be blessed. But while we have the book of Proverbs in scripture, we also have a book like Job that comes into the picture and analyzes this idea that if you do right, then good things will happen and says, well, maybe, but maybe not. There are very few guarantees. And so I don't want you to be discouraged if you feel like you're trying these things but still facing anxiety and fear. Don't feel like you're doing a bad job. Sometimes life is complicated. Sometimes life is difficult. But I wanna to try to face my fears this morning and lean into this practicality to suggest four things we can do and not do as we try to face our fears, to live into this invitation to not be anxious about anything. The first is to prioritize prayer, not productivity. 
That's actually the invitation of the Apostle Paul when he's inviting us to consider our anxiety, to not be anxious or to not worry. He says this, do not worry or do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Prayer is the first practical response to fear, prioritizing a life of prayer, even over our productivity, the things that we want to accomplish in the world. Jesus demonstrates and models this throughout his earthly ministry. Jesus is a busy guy. He has a lot of demands on his time, a lot of pressure. But Jesus is frequently retreating, going into these quiet places to pray, to reflect, to commune with God. Sometimes we talk about this as our personal devotional life, or you'll, you'll hear language about prayer closets or quiet times. Uh, these are central practices of the Christian faith. And speaking honestly, even in the best of times, I'm not great at this. This is something that takes real work and discipline for me to prioritize prayer. And it certainly has not been made any easier by the fact that my desk is now four feet from my bed. And so I can wake up in the morning and literally roll out of bed and take a couple steps and be at work. And so it's really easy, it's natural for me to wanna to propel myself into productivity, into doing things. And it helps me feel like I'm managing my anxiety because I feel less anxious when I'm accomplishing something or when I feel like I'm in control of something or when I feel like I'm understanding something. But my productivity will never outrun my anxiety. Your productivity will never outrun your anxiety. That's why the invitation, the challenge, the summons is to prioritize prayer. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when you feel that fear, when you feel that anxiety, think about what you're prioritizing. Are you prioritizing prayer or are you prioritizing your own productivity, your own accomplishments, the things that you can do to solve it and fix it? I'm not saying those are bad things. Productivity is important. Working and active response is important, but it needs to flow out of this place of prayer where we prioritize prayer, like Jesus, carving out time to commune with God, to pray. Prioritize prayer, not productivity. Second practical thing that we can do in responding to our fears is to feel our feelings, not to fake them. Christianity has a complicated relationship with feelings, particularly Western Christianity, American Christianity. I was actually listening to a preacher this week, and this was a sermon from probably years ago. He was preaching to a whole bunch of other preachers, and, and he told them to take a word out of their vocabulary. He actually called it a four-letter word that starts with F and said it's feel. And his big, deep, booming voice and his marine haircut, he said, feel has no place within Christian faith. And I thought, wow. <laughs> Has this man ever read the Bible? Because what we see in scripture is a rich vocabulary of human emotion. We see it in God, certainly. The biblical authors use emotive language, feeling language to describe God, language like love and jealousy and even anger, woundedness. This is language that the biblical authors attribute to God, emotive language. And we can have a really interesting philosophical theological debate about whether God is actually subject to passions or pathos or feeling. That's, we don't have time for that conversation right now, but we can certainly look to Jesus, the fullest revelation of God and a deeply emotional human being. Jesus weeps after the death of his friend. And as Jesus contemplates his own death, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death. This is deep feeling language. But Western Christianity, American Christianity, heavily influenced by actually pagan philosophy, has come to view human emotion as sort of a second-class citizen. We prioritize logic. We say logic is pure and holy, and emotion is questionable and suspect. And so what we tend to do is not actually feel our feelings. When our feelings come, we try to push them away and fake some better, more noble emotions. But the reality is in the, in the Christian story, every aspect of humanity was created good. Our minds, our bodies, our emotions, 
all created good and all equally subject to the effects of sin, which means that our rational, logical minds, they're susceptible to sin. Our bodies are susceptible to sin and our emotions are susceptible to sin. But the fact that all, our mind and our bodies and our emotions are all susceptible to sin doesn't mean we should try to prioritize between the three. We should recognize that all of these are part of how God has created us, even though all of them can be subject to the effects of sin. All of them can mislead us. Our rational, logical minds can mislead us. The impulses of our body can mislead us. And yes, our emotions can mislead us. But they can also be spaces where God meets us, connects with us, communes with us, cares for us. And so to think that we can be less emotional there's also some gendered language that comes into this. To think that we can be less emotional and thereby become better Christians is a misguided idea. We are invited within the Christian story to fully experience our emotions without being governed by them. We're invited to take our emotions and our logical minds and our bodies and set them all to the task of faithful discipleship, of faithfully following Jesus. But to do that, we need to be willing to feel our feelings, to experience them. There's actually this interesting tradition out of the ancient world called Stoicism. It's a philosophical tradition that was contemporary with the earliest expressions of Christian faith. There's actually some uh, urban legends within the church that suggest that Paul actually met a famous Stoic leader and converted him to Christianity, but there's no real good historical evidence for that. Uh, in our day and age, we tend to associate this word Stoic with unfeeling. That stoicism is to be unfeeling and unflinching in the face of hardship or difficulty. We don't actually experience our emotions or feel our feelings. But that's not what stoicism actually taught. What stoicism actually taught was that when you experience emotions, particularly negative emotions, you should allow them to come into you and ultimately through you. They had a phrase that they called the premeditation of evils, of thinking about that which could go wrong in advance and experiencing the emotion of it, and by experiencing it in advance, lessening it of its power. We don't see this concept taught explicitly within scripture, but Paul comes close to it at times. In Romans 8, for example, where Paul lists out a whole bunch of things that could be difficult and hard, things like death and hardship and even demons, Paul invites us to think about them, but not be overwhelmed by fear of them. We can feel our feelings even in advance, knowing that there might be hardship, there might be difficulty, there might be evil that we face, but they don't need to master us. Of course, sometimes when we think about feeling our feelings, we're afraid that we might get stuck there, that these emotions, particularly negative emotions, will overwhelm us and that we will not be able to crawl our way back to being of sound mind. But the wonderful gift that God has given us is the gift of community. That when we feel our feelings, when we experience our emotions fully, we don't need to be stuck there because we can share them with others. When we are willing to be honest about our emotional state, honest particularly about the negative emotions that we experience, we find that they're lessened of their power. They have less of a death grip on us when they aren't consigned to secrecy and spaces of shame. But when we can both experience our emotions and share them with others, this is powerful and beautiful. It's good for us to feel our feelings, not to fake them. One of the other matters of practicality we need to navigate when we're facing a world of fear is our relationship with information, our relationship with news and with media. And what I think we might wanna move toward here is that we will consume information without being consumed by it. To consume information without being consumed by it. This is certainly not easy. We all have this desire to be well informed and it helps us to feel safe. It's actually a way that we combat our fears. But because this is such a rapidly changing situation and because we have access to information that is also rapidly changing, uh, we can develop this false sense of comfort. I've, I've recognized this in myself. I keep hitting refresh on my Twitter feed thinking that the next tweet is gonna have the right answer that will solve all the difficulties and fix all the problems and alleviate all my fears. And so I'm in this like constant dopamine search trying to get that next hit of reassurance through new information. But what actually ends up happening is that I become consumed by this information. 
because there is so much uncertainty and because the science is not moving as quickly as we would like, we're all susceptible to misinformation or disinformation, to lies and conspiracy theories. They offer easy reassurance when our minds are grappling in the midst of unknown possibilities. But what we're actually doing is we are being consumed by this information. We aren't leading the way, we aren't leading ourselves, we aren't disciplining ourselves. We are allowing this information to consume us and it can paralyze us with fear. And so it could be that there need to be times that we step away, that we disconnect and turn off. And I know I even saying that there's that fear part of my brain that kicks in and says, but what if I miss the really key important thing that I need to know? But the reality is we will learn what we need to know. We will be informed. This is the only thing people want to talk about right now. And so if information is significant enough, it will likely find its way to us. But we're on that relentless quest, that relentless search for more and more information. We can actually go down some pretty unhelpful paths, veering into conspiracy theories and misinformation, seeking comfort and reassurance, but instead being fed lies. So we need to be disciplined in thinking about ways that we can consume information without being consumed by it. So if you're looking for practical ways to respond to fear, Prioritize prayer, even over productivity. Feel your feelings instead of faking them. And consume information without being consumed by it. And finally, practice self-care, but not self-absorption. Self-care is an interesting concept that has worked its way into our lexicon, and it's actually been co-opted in a lot of ways. We tend to associate self-care now with luxurious spa baths and face masks and long walks on the beach, and all those have their place, to be sure. But the phrase self-care actually comes a, out of from a, a radical black feminist by the name of Audre Lorde, uh, who said that self-care, caring for herself in a system that does not value her at all, is actually a courageous act. And so when we seek to care for ourselves, we are being courageous. But there's a fine line between caring for ourselves versus being absorbed by ourselves. There's obviously a lot that we don't like about this current situation, but one thing that I've discovered that I actually kind of love in the midst of this current situation is that a couple of local ice cream shops have started delivery services. They will bring the ice cream to your door packaged in dry ice. What a time to be alive. So we got one of these ice cream deliveries a little while ago and I was feeling kind of impulsive and so I unpackaged them and I just dipped my spoon right in. And I was putting, as I was putting the bite of ice cream in my mouth, uh, Lynn came down and said, hey, what are you doing? And through my mouthful of ice cream, I said, I'm putting my own oxygen mask on so that I can help others. <laughs> I'm not sure that was a fair use of that metaphor. We certainly heard that language and there's truth to it, that in order to be able to care for others in healthy ways, we need to be sure that we are also caring for ourselves. The grace that we want to extend to others, we also need to extend that grace to ourselves. But in order for self-care to not become self-absorption, we need to think about self-care in the appropriate ways. That it's not just about pampering, it's actually about these really unglamorous daily disciplines. Things like getting consistent sleep, eating a well-balanced diet, being physically active. These are the practical components of self-care that are actually helpful. But to avoid having our desire for self-care slip into self-absorption, which is not helpful, we need to be mindful of the why. Why did Jesus frequently retreat from the crowds to commune with his father? It was both because it was essential work and because it enabled him to engage in faithful ministry, faithful service to others. Self-care and care for others are not things that we need to hold in tension. They are part and parcel of the same thing, of being faithful followers of Jesus. We need to know that we are cared for by God and that it's okay to care for ourselves. And we need to know that God cares for others and desires for us to care for others as well. This invitation, challenge, perhaps even command of Paul to not be anxious about anything, it's incredibly difficult. It's not something that's going to come naturally or spontaneously. It's going to take both the transformative work of the Holy Spirit and our own commitment to self-discipline. 
But some steps that we can take along the way include prioritizing our prayer life, feeling our feelings, consuming information without being consumed by it, and practicing self-care without becoming self-absorbed. I want to retreat just a little bit back to my safe space, my comfort zone, thinking about ideas, and particularly the ideas of one Christian thinker in the 13th century by the name of Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas wrote about fear, and he said something really p profound and provocative. He said this, he says, all fear arises from love. All fear arises from love. Since no one fears except what is contrary to something that they love. Do you understand what Aquinas is saying here? He's saying that the fears that we experience, the anxieties that we experience, are all rooted in love. We're afraid of something that we love being lost or suffering harm, and so we're afraid. So the act of fear begins from a place of love. But what Aquinas reminds us is that there is both ordered and disordered love. It is possible to love the right things in the right way, but it is also possible to love the right things in the wrong way or to love the wrong things in the wrong way. There is ordered and disordered love. So the question when we're afraid is, what are we loving and how are we loving it? If our loves are ordered in the right way and we feel fear, that's an act of genuine love and compassion, seeking to protect that which is important. But when these fears become overwhelming, when they escalate to the level of paralyzing, crippling anxiety, we need to ask ourselves if our loves are disordered. And this is actually the heart of Christian discipleship, to have our loves brought into order with that which God desires for us so that we would love the right things in the right way. The goal of Christian discipleship is that we would love as God loves, that our love would not be marked and marred by sin, not turned toward self-interest and self-absorption, but that our love would mirror the love of God who causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, who is broadly, broadly, widely indiscriminate in love toward creation. So if we find ourselves slipping into self-absorption, if fear is paralyzing us, making it hard to think about anything except our own self-interest, there is an opportunity there. That as we bring our cares before God through prayer, as we commit to the discipline of discipleship, of seeking to follow Christ, to take our thoughts and our emotions captive to the Lordship of Jesus, we will find that God is transforming our loves. Our loves are being brought into the right order so that the things that we love and the ways that we love them look like the ways that God loves. And this is the way, ultimately, that we can live a life free from anxiety, where we will not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, we will bring our requests before God, knowing that we can trust God because God loves us and God loves everyone. And as we trust God, we too can be transformed into those who are filled with the love of God for others. Let's pray together. Gracious, merciful God, we give you thanks that instead of being paralyzed by our anxieties, we can come before you in prayer. We can come to you for the wonderful, transformative, powerful work of your Holy Spirit, bringing us into conformity with the likeness and image of Christ so that we would love the world as you love the world. And we pray you would continue this work in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.